Uh, during the break, during the lunch, Matt Witherton came up to me. He's from Atlanta, came here with his spouse, who's also a lawyer. Where's Matt? There they are. And he gave me this. Uh, based on his work as product liability, he designed the modern tire designed for profit. And he talks about tire defects, tire recalls, how many people actually turned in their cars, about a, less than a third, right? Who actually... 20% out of 6 million. Out of 6 million. Uh, he's developed a database, thousands of pieces of information on all kinds of different tires, which you have. Um, and there's more to it. And this is an example of what one person can do. Right? Just one person. More trial lawyers should do that because they have access to a lot of internal documents. And they subpoena information, depositions, interrogatories. So every time I see something like this, I say there's 70,000 trial lawyers. How many are like him? Maybe 100? What if it was 1,000? What if it was 2,000? It's hardly a big step. There was a trial lawyer who specialized in dangerous toys for kids out of Boston, Ed Schwartz. And here's what he did. People say, toys? Ha, ha, ha. Actually, children have been killed, burned, electrocuted, toxified, swallowing stuff because of the design of the toy, tiny things that could be swallowed. So he, he's written three, he wrote three books. He's passed away. He wrote three books. He wrote articles. He had a sixth grade teaching lesson on the civil justice for sixth graders, teaching them about civil justice through toys. A lot of them imported bad toys. Pushed the Product Safety Commission to recall toys, to issue toy standards. And every December, early December, he got on the Today Show. He was Mr. Toy. One person. See the potential? It's easier than we think. It's a matter of character and personality. It's not a matter of knowledge. Knowledge is the key. Knowledge doesn't have its own momentum. Knowledge cannot overcome self-censorship. Knowledge cannot change personality and character. It is normative impulse. It's the thirst for justice. It's the a visceral attack on bullies. Anyone who grew up in the third, fourth, and fifth grade and didn't like bullies is a different person when they grow up. I don't mean that they were bullied. Little kids who watched other kids be bullied and entered the fray and shouted at the bully. They are different kids. They're going to be different people. So anyway, that's good. Thank you. Now, before we see the Iraq thing, and I want you to see it not for you. I want you to see it as if you showed this to an indifferent group of citizens on Iraq. They don't even know where Iraq is. Would this f fill the bill in terms of moving them from co cognition into emotional intelligence? Listen to the, how, how relatively easy it is. The propaganda by Bush Cheney was overwhelming. You remember that? Day after day, they had their retired military next to the anchors, CBS, ABC. I mean, the Kremlin couldn't have done it better. The, the Democrats were cowards, ex with a few exceptions, in Congress. There were 300 ex-generals, admirals, colonels, former NSA top officials, and leading diplomats who spoke out against the Iraq war before it happened in the nine months. This never happened in American history. You had four-star Marine General Anthony Zinni, Middle East specialist. No, 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 he spoke out. He said to the Washington Post, most of the high uh, offices in the U.S. Army and the Pentagon agreed with him, but they were, they were muzzled. The former head of the NSA, four-star general, Howard Odom. No, no, no. The worst blunder in American foreign policy. Didn't get much press. 
Then you had the two uh, chief foreign policy assistants to, assistants to George Herbert Walker Bush, Brent Scowcroft and James Baker. You can't get any higher. Op-eds, speeches, right? Couldn't get on Capitol Hill for hearings. Because that Bush and Cheney had the media, they had the Republicans, they had the Democrats cowed, and they had the, the thirst for profits that corporations saw was coming. His buddies, his supporters, he saw it as a chance to stifle dissent, to divert attention from domestic matters, which he didn't care about, and to basically provide endless contracts for his corporate backers. So it's a win-win for him. That's the way he saw it. And he, he said he avenged his father. You know, the Saddam Hussein was going to had a plot to kill his father. That's been debunked. But anyway, the difference, of course, is this. What if George Soros decided he was against the war, he wrote against the war, he put it in books. He's, he was worth $13 billion at the time. He makes a couple billion a year now. Currency manipulation and speculation. He's a genius at it. Started the Open Society Institute. Has more understanding of what it takes to build a democracy than any rich man in, in our time. What if you put $200 million behind those 300 former generals, admirals, NSA people, and leading diplomats, all retired? Who's going to question their loyalty? Who's going to question their patriotism? Who's going to question their experience? Because that's what they do against dissenters, right? Most dissenters, that's the way they slam them down. Within two weeks, those 300 would be 900. It would be all over the media. It would be news. He could have a mass media for advertisements. It would have broken the barrier on Capitol Hill. It would expose the lies, falsehoods, deceptions, and cover-ups that led our country into the Iraq quagmire unconstitutionally. As Ron Paul said, they lied us into Iraq, they meaning Bush and Cheney. See how easy that would have been? We were contacting George Soros, couldn't get through. Couldn't get through his screen. We were working night and day to stop the Iraq war. We had 13 groups with millions of members, National Council of Churches, labor unions, veterans of wars, veterans for peace, etc. We had student groups. We even had hedge fund groups. We had retired intelligence people. They each wrote Bush a letter in January, February, before the March 23rd invasion of 2003. And they said, we want to meet with you. We represent hundreds of thousands, millions of people. We think you need to hear what we say. Some of us have been to Iraq and we're back never even bothered to acknowledge the letters. No dictator could have been so insensitive. And despite all this, about half of the American people opposed the war. Just think of that. Isn't that optimistic? A complete propaganda barrage, basically unrebutted. And in their instinct, half of them said, we shouldn't go in even though they were told that Saddam was connected to 9-11. That wasn't explicit, but it was very implicit by Bush, especially by Cheney. That was a lie. They were mortal enemies. He was a secularist. And they were fundamentalists. Even though he didn't have weapons of mass destruction, actually they, what he had was destroyed after the first Gulf War. Even though he wasn't a threat to his neighbors, are you kidding? He was a tot tottering dictator who didn't know where he could sleep safely at night in any of his palaces, presiding over a dilapidated army that couldn't get spare parts, not to mention their morale. He's going to be a threat to Turkey, Israel, I Iran. All false. 
For this, they were not impeached, and subsequent to their departure from government, they were not criminally prosecuted, as the government was about to criminally prosecute Richard Nixon for the Watergate obstruction of justice. Compare the two levels of violation. All right, so before we see that, I, I want to lay a predicate on the duties of citizens, okay? This is extremely important because we don't like to face up to that. We think we are, we are uh, hectoring each other when we talk to each other about our duties. Okay, the Constitution have a Bill of Rights. We have a Bill of Rights. We do not have a Bill of Duties. There's only one duty implied in the Constitution, and that's jury duty, Seventh Amendment. It doesn't say in the Constitution you have to serve. It's implied because if you don't serve, there are no juries. So it's been made statutorily with constitutional authorization to be a duty. That is the only duty we have. So let's use the word permissive. When a society that purports to be democratic is excessively permissive to the only people who can make it democratic, you get leakage, huge leakage. You get escape, you get withdrawal, you get abdication of one's civic responsibilities. When you get abdication, you're likely to get a pretty crummy government. When you get a crummy government, you're likely to get a lot of citizens turning off. And so it reinforces itself in a vicious circle. Okay, so let's discuss briefly civic duties. The first civic duty is serious conversation. That's why I gave you the $2 bill. I'm inviting the only rebuke that I really am sensitive to. Has anybody here spent that dollar, $2 bill? I bought your book. <laughs> That's no excuse. <laughs> okay. So let's start. I don't think there are many discussions like you're going to now enter into because they're full of taboos. Talking in terms of disciplined citizenry is a taboo. It's like, who the hell do you think you are? Are you, you think you're better than we are? And aren't you arrogant? And stop chiding me. Get off my back. I've got other concerns in life that are more immediate and more insistent on my time and energy. But if you don't give time to your citizen duties, you're going to have more problems in life. You're going to have to spend your life taking care of your relatives and lose your income. You're going to have to spend your life shuttling back and forth and spending a huge amount of your income on commuting one car, one person at a time instead of good public transit and paying a thousand bucks a month for daycare. On and on. So we have to say, look, we're going to discuss a taboo. So Washington is full of taboos. It is the most densely populated area of taboos in the United States. So we started a website called debatingtaboos.org. You can go to it. We had four taboos debated in the Carnegie Institution. I mean, actual real time and they are on the website, debatingtaboos.org. The first one was compulsory voting. Margaret Mead told me don't use the word compulsory. Use the word universal. But I'm going to use the word compulsory right now. We're not going to sugarcoat it. If everybody voted, you could have conversations with everybody on politics, almost by definition. If everybody voted, the poor would vote at the same level as the rich. It's now almost three to one. So lower income people, minorities, people who are down and out, uh, young people voted a very lower percentage. 
Those are the people we need to vote, given we have a plutocracy. Okay, give me the arguments against compulsory voting. Throw everything you got against me. You Let's send, go. You gotta send them to jail if they don't vote? No, we're gonna do what Australia does, a fine of 25 to $50, which goes into the electoral pot. And if you're sick, you can get an excused. Australia has a voting turnout between 96 and 97%. At the most, we hit 60%. At Australia, they never, politicians never have to spend huge money begging people to turn out. They never have to have telephone banks. They never have to have TV ads. Please, please vote. Now you think what difference that make? 15 to $16 an hour minimum wage, universal health insurance, a better safety net, a lower unemployment rate, and they got a plutocracy there, but they got a safety, safety net. Okay, so it's not criminalized. It's a civil fine. Next. What? If, like, the, will, would it automatically educate the people who are uh, so uh, completely disengaged from sure. the world that I mean, they don't want, they don't feel like there's anything that they All kinds of want. pamphlets, websites, little meetings, Whatever, I mean. Okay, but that's because they can get away with not voting. Okay, when you have compulsory voting, you have affirmative duty as a, as, as a government to facilitate Voting, either now, of course, it's this. So, so, you know, by mail, Oregon, Colorado, you, you got absentee voting with huge latitudes. For heaven's sake, they don't even have to go to the polls anymore. However, when you are required to vote, anyone who obstructs you is committing a crime. Therefore, there is a, a duty to enforce the law. Right now, People who obstruct you. It's like politics as usual. Hey, hey, look at, you know, look at the voter suppression thing. Has anybody gone to jail for trying to block people from voting? I mean, they, they obstructed us as candidates. That was a big joke. You know, the, the Democrats harassed our petitioners. They went to a woman's home when she's cooking dinner for her grandchildren and said, you're petitioning for the Nader candidacy in Oregon. Do you know that you've got fraudulent signatures and you can go to jail? It's a complete lie. What happens was there were a few people who, who basically deliberately wrote fraudulent names to contaminate our petition. So now it's like, it's just like, hey, that's politics, you know? Grow up. All right, what else? You're, you're assuming that if everybody votes, we'll see those changes that you earlier talked about because everybody's voting. But now I've talked to people who say that uh, the, the corporate media makes a big deal about how low the turnout's getting, and they always want it to be over 50%, and yeah. that somehow gives it legitimacy. And now I know some people say, if, if it's Hillary and Romney, I'm not going to vote, because yeah. I, when I vote, I am legitimizing the system. You're, you're detouring. What, how, how is that an argument against compulsory voting? You're making another point. Yeah, you're making a, okay, argue against, yeah. My vote doesn't count. What do you mean your vote doesn't count? Well, I actually documented my vote not counting this time because I voted right in and the county said there were no write-in candidates. Okay. But when you have compulsory voting, Carol, you don't have a write-in vote where they can throw it away the way they threw our write-in votes away in Oklahoma. But if under the whole system. Pardon? Why would you want to write it in? I don't know why, but many do. Only if there's a space. I mean, each state. Okay. You're, you're getting to something. You're getting, let's see if we can flesh it out. Yeah. National rules for national elections, not every state making their own rule about registration, same day right. registration, who can vote, who can't. All eliminated right. when you have compulsory voting. Gone. Yes. Yeah, way out there. I'm an elections inspector. I, I can tell you there are people out there who 
There are people out there. There are people out there who are, I've said, throwing darts at, at the ballot. Yeah. I had a, someone who voted five times in the governor column. Right. That, yeah. That's a criminal offense. No, no. Th this was ignorance, and I'm telling you. It was cl uh, pure ignorance. Um, it, you know, they. Uh, that's all I'm saying. I mean, it's... That's my answer to your question. <laughs> you will get some people who will rebel. And no, they're just not, they're, they don't know what's going on. They're they throwing don't darts at the ballot. No, no, they will be taught what's going on, just the way you're taught how to use small claims court without a lawyer. That's part of the teaching process. When you have a compulsory duty, you have a strong correlative to that, which is to iron out those kinds of problems and to, and to help people. Yeah? The basic argument is, it takes away my right. I have the right to not vote. Uh, I mean, that's what uh, I. Now that's we're getting down to the nitty gritty, right? Okay. Here's. Give me another civil liberty argument beside that one. Yeah. States right. In, in other words, each of the fifty states makes their own uh, local voting. That's true. Rules and so. That's true. That's what I'm saying. State every state compulsory voting. Yeah. Go ahead. Against my free speech rights to force me to make a decision in that voting booth. Okay. Okay. So here's your choice. Let me see if you still persist. <laughs> here's the choice. You can vote for candidates. Okay. No, no, no. I know. Let's say you can vote for candidates on the ballot. You can vote for yourself. You can vote for a write-in candidate. Or you can vote no to all of them. None of the above. That's the answer yeah. there. And yeah. that is the one thing I've heard so many times is if I had a choice for none of the above, and if none of the above wins, then that is a protest that you have not given us candidates we feel we want to elect and we want another. That's right. If you have binding none of the above, it cancels that line of candidates and say in 30 days, new election, new candidates. So by, none of the, now there's only one place in the country that has none of the above statewide, but it's not binding. But on some occasions, it's actually coming second. It's Nevada. It's, it, it's not binding, though. If it was binding, people would take it more seriously. Now, this is, this is an action project to get none of the above in your town or your state. It's called None of the Above Advanced Packet an idea whose time has come, this is coming out of our group, our group, it has everything you can think of to start a campaign, right down to a model news release, a model letter to the editor, planning a local NOTA conference, how to build support for NOTA, on and on. Okay? Here's where I'm coming to. And Arthur made a good suggestion, which I was very attuned to, that before we end this weekend, I'm going to propose five action projects. And you can pick whatever one, or six. And you can pick whatever one you have, and then you have a little gathering, you know, split off in different parts of this room. And then you will report back. You will pre-select yourself in terms of which one you like, and you will report back. When the ACLU objected to mandatory voting, we presented all these options. So you, there is no vote, there is no no vote in America. You cannot vote no. If you vote, you have to vote yes to something. So there's no no confidence vote. And of course, a lot of people stay home because they don't have confidence in any of them. It's, it's not just, quote, apathy, okay? Some of it is, but all of it is, hey, this is mean thing to me. That these people are charlatans. I, I don't want to have anything to do with them. But if you give a NOTA opportunity, and this can be at the, at the local level, I think. I don't think state law is going to preempt this in, in most states. Uh, this, is a, this is one of the projects. And this is, this is ready to go. You add your own ideas and suggestions, but if anybody says, how do you get it underway? You know, this is like 35 pages of, of practical detail. Yes. I just have one problem with that. Go ahead. The, uh, if you do the, um, make it, say that you have to have the election 30 days later, 
elections cost a lot of money and a lot of local communities don't really want to have to do that. That's so right. it's, it's just I'm not saying 30 days later. I, I'm saying this. The very presence of a none of the above has an impact on the candidates. The very presence. The fear. I mean, just think. You're running for state office and you, in Massachusetts. And by 9 o'clock at night, they've told you that you've been defeated. And you say, damn, Jim, he ran a dirty campaign. And the person tells you, it wasn't Jim. <laughs> it was none of the above. And you got to call your daughter at Skidmore and tell her who beat you. OK? Uh, so it does. Now, it's a small price to pay. Let's put it that way. A small price, given what politicians spend their money on, very small price to pay. Yes? I, mean, I, I look at, that's perfect. Everyone I've talked to across the country about voting yeah. in the last month has, has expressed so much outrage that they don't feel that they're voting for anything that they want. Yeah. And, even, and especially with so many candidates running unopposed, there yeah. is no election, it's not a vote, they've already won. Right. And that there is no way in our process of voting in this country to protest when you vote. You can write what you want, you can draw pictures, you can put your name down, but nobody counts it because there is no none of these. This has the biggest effect in a one-party dominated district. Yeah. We've been discussing it for weeks and to see that that's all pulled together already yeah. is wonderful. I, I know it's not the same thing, but in New York State as an elections inspector, when we had the levers, yeah. you couldn't get out of the booth without flipping a lever. lever. Party lever? <laughs> Any, well, one lever had to be flipped. He couldn't, oh, yeah, it, it, it wouldn't let you open yeah. the door. The, the, the <laughs> curtain would yeah. open. But yeah. since yeah. we changed over, I have been making a lot of <coughs> blank votes. Uh, so I've been voting for none of the above, but it's not the same thing because yeah. it's, it's in silence. But I have been speaking yeah. to people about it. Yeah, interesting. Uh, the interesting thing about, we have a system dominated by voting machines and software not everywhere, but most places, it's all a procurement scam. I mean, these companies come and, you know, they can campaign contributions and give us the contract. Do you know Canada doesn't have those machines? In Canada, it's all paper ballot. And by 11 o'clock at night, in this sprawling country bigger than ours, from the Arctic to Nova Scotia, they know who won. Did you see the ballots for Scotland? No. They were just a very simple paper ballot. Yes, no. Should, yes, no. That's right. That's right. Did you ever see the Canadian Universal Medicare bill compared to the Affordable Bill, the Affordable Health Act? Well, that was well over a thousand pages. Thirteen pages. Everybody in? Nobody out? Free choice of doctor and hospital. Public funding? Private delivery. They do it on half the price, better outcomes, nobody dies because they don't have health insurance, free choice of doctor and hospital. How many people now with these networks tightening like nooses, these doctor and hospital networks? How many people have free choice of doctor and hospital? In, 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 in hospital? Okay, um, let's take another civic duty. Give me another civic duty. We got jury duty. We've got voting duty. What's another civic duty? Paying taxes. Okay. Or elaborate. If you work, well, most people, if they work, have to pay taxes right. in order to fund the infrastructure right. that supports our community. Okay. Okay. The IRS reports that every year over $300 billion of uncollected taxes. B. Billion. Okay, so that's, you know, that's more than the entire budgets of most departments and agencies in government outside the de Defense Department and Department of State. That's a lot of money. So there are a lot of people evading. Some of them are called corporations. They do it big time. We're not talking avoiding where they get the law through that lets them escape. That's legal, even though it's, it's unfair, it's legal because they game the system. 
Uh, and that's why General Electric, for example, can make billions of dollars in U.S. profits, pay no federal income tax, and get a, get a quote, refund <laughs> from the Treasury Department, right? It's called the benefit. They get, actually get a check. They come out ahead. Um, and there are a lot of others that escape. So that, hap that means two things can happen. One, you have to pay more, or you get less service. You get fewer. That's why your public works may not be uh, repaired. What, any, what other jury, whatever duty of citizenship? Obey the laws of the land. Yes. That argues, by the way, for why we should have compulsory voting. If we have to obey the laws of our lawmakers, who are our representatives, we darn sure should have to have universal voting. It's another argument. Yes, Margaret? That is what? Yes. That is no, no longer the case, but that was you can call that a civic duty, being drafted, legally being drafted, but they don't have that anymore. Yes, you do have to register. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah? I mean, just as devil's advocate, as good as it sounds, they're going to rig it. They're going to rig the voting. I can't hear you. They're going to rig the voting, as good as that is. Don't you think they're always going to want that a corporation is now going to own that? I mean, it's always going to be, they're going to, whatever we do on the good side, they're going to find a way out. It's a good point. They'll all try it. Look, look how they've uh, gamed the franchise, right? They fought the vote, universal vote, not the universal duty to vote, the universal vote. In other words, the Senate was elected by state legislatures by design of the Constitution originally before it was amended. And in some communities, if you didn't have property, you didn't vote. And if you were black and women, you didn't vote until, you know, constitutional amendments, civil rights laws. Okay, so now everybody can vote, let's say, in, in theory. And how do they game the vote? They game the vote by money, nullifying the effect of votes. They game the votes by obstructing the vote. They game the vote by obstructing third, fourth party candidates to give people more choice, which brings out more votes. They game the vote by stopping the initiative referendum recall in half of the country's states because that brings out people to vote. If they want to vote for the candidates, they want to vote for the initiative. Like uh, four out of four minimum wage restoration initiatives in red states passed on Tuesday. The same states that elected Republicans passed a minimum wage increase. See the, see the left-right alliance on that? Arkansas, Nebraska, Alaska, forgot the other state. So, what is it? Yeah, Illinois. So, yeah, they try to game it. So what? I mean, you just you just keep you if you know that ahead of time, you know how to tighten uh, the noose around. They're trying to game it. Game it. As a duty. Judy, I'm talking about how they get, they're gaming the vote. Now they're disenfranchising uh, yes. voters, mainly black voters, by yeah. requiring ID. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're losing in court though. I, I think that whole thing is going to blow over in a few years, short years, fortunately. But you see, they never stop, do they? I mean, it's just a. Okay. Most states now have said convicted felons who've done their time can still vote. Florida is, is an exception, and uh, there's probably a couple hundred people, a couple million people in the country who can't vote because they're ex-felons. By the way, that alone shifted the election in 2004 in Florida, because what happened is that the Secretary of State, remember her, for Jeb Bush, she hired a consulting firm to weed out ex-felons from the voting rolls. And what happened is they took erroneously or deliberately thousands of names of non-ex-felons who had the same names as ex-felons and disenfranchised them. Just another sine qua non of this. So give me another duty. Well, yeah. I just, on the voting issue, I guess I feel that our 
our state is highly reflective of the populace in terms of idea ideology. Yeah. And that, you know, allowing and opening it up, it'll still be reflective of it. And perhaps the, the third party candidate will be voted in or will emerge okay. when it needs to happen, when society is ready to. What allow. state is this? Just in general. Oh, just in general. Okay. What else? Yes. Well, it goes back to tax duty because I think somebody <coughs> fell down on the job. Not that anyone wants to hear this, but remember when commerce first started being transacted on the internet? I remember checking with the state revenue department on sales tax because they said the burden was on the <coughs> buyer to pay or at least retain the uh, amount of sales tax when dealing with other <coughs> out of state you know, people yeah. that they couldn't enforce on. And so, you know, I kind of kept a little aside, not for very long, but, you know, I know, what an idiot. But um, to the point, it, it was laughable. And when you think about the consequences, <coughs> of what it did to local business, um, you, you know, there's a lot of benefits they come, but basically it's all chasing price, which of course chase chase production out of the country, as you were describing earlier. But, but I think they were derelict in their collection duties. Okay. Very early on, probably because they just didn't get it. Okay. So uh, sum up, why don't we have a discussion like this in all elections? Presidential, congressional, state. Why don't they discuss this? Well, I mean, that's a parochial response. Thank you very much. But, but generally speaking, what keeps people like Elizabeth Warren uh, from discussing universal voting? What's the, na what's the nature of the taboo? She thinks she could lose votes that way? It's an unpredictable foray, foray in the unknown? You know, politicians don't like that. There's no precedent for someone doing it and winning votes. But you see how uniform the self-censorship is? When I was running, uh, I opened that up all the time. I, I opened it up. And you can see how I was rep repaid. See, nobody said, hey, he's really for universal voting. The press didn't even pick it up. It was like I was talking about landing on Mars. <laughs> you see, the press doesn't pick something up unless someone of power, like Speaker of the House or somebody, says it, or a governor, or they think the votes are uh, near in the legislature to pass it. It's like a vicious circle. If an issue doesn't attach to power, it doesn't get noticed, it doesn't get discussed, therefore it never has a chance to attach to power. All right, this is a good discussion for you to have with, obviously, with your, your friends. Go ahead. Uh, so most of our discussion is trying to figure out how to get the right candidates in, yeah. whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. There isn't much on accountability of whoever was in there in general. So Good point. We spent, as a country, $48 trillion from 2000 to 2014. Couldn't we you know, assess how that $48 trillion was spent as citizens? You mean, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, so the citizens are, we delegate our power to the representative, but we're, we don't delegate, we shouldn't delegate our responsibility for the outcome. Okay, right. It's, I thought you were making another point, maybe you are. Why don't we focus on incumbents? I mean, isn't that when most of the time is between elections? We're always focusing on elections to the extent we focus. I wanna see civic movements that push left-right coalitions in Congress. And for example, we have Lori Wallach, she was on Democracy Now!, She's part, she leads the Global Trade Watch for Public Citizen. And she's arguing against NAFTA and WTO and the Pacific Trade Agreement. It's about to come through Obama to the Congress for affirmation. She has right now a majority of the House, left-right, to stop fast track. Fast track means it goes to the Congress, limited debate, no amendments, up or down. 
and then you have the corporate lobbies pushing it, and you have the White House pushing it. You can't have extended debate. You can't reach more media by having more days of debate for this horrendous suppression of consumer labor and environmental rights. These aren't just trade agreements. Trade agreements are supposed to deal with trade, right? Tariffs, quotas. The new trade agreement, misnamed, the new WTO and NAFTA, basically say that if countries pass strong or have strong consumer labor and environmental laws, those can be considered trade barriers, okay? And therefore, a country abroad that doesn't have those strong laws, wants to ship goods to us, can take us to the secret tribunals, literally, in Geneva under the WTO, and say that the U.S. is using environmental laws to keep out our imported cars. It's using food safety labeling laws to keep out Brazilian food exports to the U.S., strike them down. And unlike all other trade agreements before NAFTA, these agreements have teeth. They can be enforced with counter tariffs, fines, etc. But they use the word trade agreement. Free trade. This isn't free trade. This is corporate managed trade. If you want a free trade agreement with another country, it'll take two pages. Why is it 800 pages? Because it's full of rules. And who writes the rules? The corporate lobbyists. And now they want a trade agreement in intellectual property so they can lock in genetically engineered patents and take the neem tree in India and other flora and fauna and control them monopolistically. And they bribe the regulatory officials in, in India. And Indian farmers are committing suicides in massive amounts because GMO crops attach themselves to industrial farming that begins to drive out the small farmer in India. So you see, it's far more than just tariffs <laughs> and quotas. Okay, so you're dealing here with the, the left, the only thing that can stop it is a left-right coalition. Now Obama and the corporation is going to go to work on the members. They're going to say, would you like this bridge in your district? They did this to beat us on NAFTA. We had the votes against NAFTA, and they carved out about 20 of the representatives. But you see, it's all being done by a handful of good people. Just a handful. You could fit them in this room. What if there were 10 times the number around the country? What if they were in congressional districts? You would never see these trade agreements because they are complete suppression of our ability as a nation to be first. We couldn't have had airbags because they would have had to go to committees of the WTO so that we sandpaper them into a uniform low common denominator standard and we'd be outvoted. Get WTO is so democratic, it's autocratic. For example, it has 175 members, state nations. Every nation has the same one vote. So St. Kitts, with 75,000 people in the Caribbean, has the same vote as China or the U.S. Now you'd say, well, isn't that wonderful? I mean, one nation, one vote? But these nations are very vulnerable to being taken over by some multinationals or some banks. So it's very hard to amend it, but it's not hard to get out. Every nation can give six months notice and get out. We could get out and say, we're getting out unless we change these rules. We open up the tribunals, we drop the secrecy, and we no longer allow trade agreements to suppress consumer, environmental, and worker standards. We want trade agreements in workers, you know, to lift workers up and write to unions, fine. We want trade agreements in consumer issues like medicines, fine. We want trade agreements in environment, fine. They want trade agreements on trade, fine. But you do not suppress the most important advances in a, in, in a signatory nation to the supremacy and tyranny of commercial trade. Yes? But I remember the NAFTA debates, and they told us that even though there aren't environmental and labor uh, laws, we are going to fix it later. And so that makes your whole argument a little 
Ah, well, actually, Obama promised it in 2008, and he betrayed us. He, on the debates, he said, we're going to fix NAFTA. And he said, uh, we're going to do it on labor and environmental issues. And uh, that was the end of it. So he didn't do it. He, now he's going NAFTA on steroids, called the Pacific uh, Trade Agreement. Ralph, what about the case of Argentina, where two hedge funds are holding them hostage to repay debt to two funds controlled by individual capitalists in the U.S. to threaten to bring down the whole country. Well, that's the problem of being indentured to international finance. And you'll see all the full-page ads. You see them by, there's, there's the hedge fund ads and there's the Argentine funds and they, they well, they, you know, uh, defaulted on their debt and back and forth and you know most people say what's all this about it, this is what happens when you have excessive interdependency between rich nations and less rich nations you're going to get hosed that's what change the name to Pacific Green Pacific what? Pacific Green Green? Green Oh oh Pacific Green <laughs> Okay, now the reason why I, I chose to have this discussion before this, excuse me, is because I don't want you to look at this and say, ah, people won't get off their duff and do anything. I mean, there's got to be internal discipline among voters. There's got to be internal discipline among co-op members. They've got to show up. It doesn't work if they don't show up. Not just enough to pay their dues or get their refunds or buy, they've got to show up. The Berkeley co-op collapsed because one, not enough people showed up, and two, they fought over South Africa. They fought over external issues uh, to the co-op, which isn't bad, by the way. I mean, t to use economic power to focus on US policy, apartheid, and disinvestment, and so forth. But. Showing up, you cannot say that phrase enough. And showing up is facilitated by a growing sense of civic duty. Now, if we were in a shipwreck and we ended up in a huge rowboat and you had 50 people in the rowboat and they had 50 oars and there was a coming storm after the sunlight break that, you know, before two storms broken by sunlight, and there is an island 10 miles away. And so you all started rowing. But you're in the front of the boat, and it doesn't seem to be moving very fast. And you look like this, and you got people with crossing their legs, listening to radio, you know, having a good time. What do you say to them? If you, don't, if you don't row with us, we're done for. You're going to row. Now, I, made a, I, I left out a key factor in Western Massachusetts, 1774. I don't know if you noticed it. I said when they surrounded the Tory sheriff or the Tory judge, the Tory was asked to recant. And then I said the Tory had two options, but I left one out. The two options were flee to Boston and hide behind the Redcoat garrison. The other option, be shunned. So they wouldn't supply them with food, agricultural food. They wouldn't buy anything. And how about this for control? They wouldn't bring any of their grievances to court. So these people were sitting there with no business. They weren't, didn't have any cases. They looked like fools. So they were either shunned, or they fled, or they recanted. What I'm saying is, we've got to develop a locked arm society. Because look, we can be independent and self-reliant up to a point, but we know darn well. There comes a line which we're gonna sink or swim. If we don't pull together, we'll hang separately the way Benjamin Franklin said. And that's the, that's the kind of value system that we wanna build institutions around, like cooperatives, like buying clubs, you know, in the economy. A lot of this is reflected in the possibility of the internet, which is, I'm gonna put one of those projects for those of you who are very internet savvy, 
to work on. If you can show how to build preliminary citizen advocacy groups of 10,000 people contributing an average of $30 and fielding X number of advocates, say, on genetic engineering or nanotechnology, getting, let's say, say, focused on Congress. If you could show how that could be done, we'll have a huge flurry of institutional growth in one area after another. And for those of you who think that that may not be enough, you're right, but those of you who think it's not worth your while, most of the great environmental consumer uh, legislation was spearheaded by a handful of environmental groups and consumer groups. Yes? Why can't we build on 350.org? That's a national network, internet-based, and I'm paying them $5 a month. That could be one if they're willing to allow us access to their list. People are very possessive, as you know, about their list. But that's, that's one of the things you might want to suggest. How to get 10, now you shouldn't be that hard when you have free access to millions of people. Have you looked at Kickstarter? Have you looked at change.org? Change.org is a, where you have petitions and then you basically have a petition on something and you lock it in on change.org and then people can sign up. And the White House has said, if you get over 100,000, we'll answer you. You gotta get 100,000 members on some issue. Uh, the problem is there are so many petitions, it's so fractured, the audience now, that, that people, people can't even clear the, the forest, they can't get the trees because of the forest. So there's always something that has to be worked on and clarified in a, in a more uh, responsive manner. Now, can we have a... Are you still, are you still taking suggestions about compulsory things? Yeah, we're almost done. Go ahead. Because there are two, there are two that, that are obvious. What? That we all do, that we haven't mentioned so far. Education is compulsory. We accept that in America. Compulsory, you, you, yeah. You, you have, have to go to school. You have to get an education. Yeah, you, you have, have, to have to go to school until you're 16. And the other is uh, licensure. We take licensure for granted. Professionals have to get licenses. Right. People who drive cars have to get licenses. Right. We have to get a license if we want to get married. That's um, not a civic duty. That's a regulatory requirement to make a livelihood. But the, the school one is, uh, is basically a civic duty. Good point. Okay, now, just, just watch this. Now, this film was started by a producer who went on the internet and he got 3,000 people to fund it. It was crowdfunding. That's the way he made this, uh, this DVD. And he says right on the DVD, thank you the 3,000 people who made it possible. Uh, one of the things that this section doesn't include that I thought <clears throat> really hit home before we talk about it is uh, that KBR had the food contract. You know, I was a cook in the Army. The Army can feed itself. I can assure you of that. And it's contracted out. And here's, it's contracted on the grounds that it's more efficient and we have more people in the Army fighting. They don't have to be cooks. Okay. Now here's, here's one provision of the contract. They're paid by the plate. So the GIs go into the cafeteria and the food is hot. So they pick up a plate and they put the food, but it, it's too hot. So they pick up another plate and put it under the food. Each plate is $38. See how the game is played? Uh, they had uh, they were contracting out for dogs, sniffer dogs, with their handlers. One handler, one dog insured, and the assurance they'll replace the dog if the dog gets killed sniffing mines. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. One guy told me he showed the dogs on a screen, and he said, these dogs get better health care than Millions of Americans, they're taken care of better. I said, well, why doesn't the Army have its own dogs? He said, they do, but we have the best dogs. And he had them in names, you know, he gave the dog names. It's like minting money. A cook, he contracted out for a cook, 170000 to $200,000 a cook, six-month tour of duty. You think the cook got that? 
the cook is lucky to get 40, maybe 50, raked off for the company. So what's the big thing missing in that? By what? Sessions, the Senator Sessions, after all that, runs on the post for the U.S. Senate. Just nice. ran in, just got reelected again in uh, Tuesday. But what's the thing that's missing? They got away with it. There were some Pentagon audits, and they had to give back some money here and there. And, they, you know, they gave it back here, took it there. The contracts are not online. Uh, they can be full text online. So outside people can analyze them. It's called the golden handshake when they di literally underbid in order to get the contracts, called lowballing. They underbid, they get the contract, and then they, re then they tell the Pentagon, we can't possibly deal with this. But the Pentagon is stuck with them. And so two years later, they have the golden handshake where they amend and give them hundreds of millions more dollars. That's the way the su nuclear submarines and all the other weapons operate lowball, get the contract. Now they don't even have to lowball because there have been so many mergers that there are only four major primary contractors for the Pentagon's business, Lockheed Martin being a number one. All the rest are subcontract. Remember, remember the $450 claw hammer scandal? Well, th th that's when the American people really got upset, not the billions of dollars that's behind this, above the, you know, the scale. The Pentagon was exposed paying $450 for a $10 claw hammer you can get in a hardware store. So, and it was big news, and you know, there were a lot of embarrassed faces. The Pentagon people later told others that that was the most embarrassing contract scandal. Not the millions, billions <laughs> of cost overruns and the corruption, no. It was a claw hammer because people could relate to it, right? Well, I went and investigated how could they possibly write that check when they knew that they could get it for 10 bucks? And here's how it works. You contract for an operation or a weapon system with the primary contractor. They then go to the second contractor, who subcontracts to the third contractor, who subcontracts to the fourth. That's why the contractors can send tell members of Congress there are jobs in every district. You see, and they give them maps. So the final contractor, let's say he charges $25 for the claw hammer, goes up to the next level, markup, goes up to the next level, markup, goes up to the next level. That's how it's done. There are Pentagon auditors, you know, they're beleaguered, they don't get much political support, they come out with some good condemnatory reports, but basically, it's going through the motions. They got away with it. Cheney got away with it. He had huge deferred compensation in Halliburton. The Halliburton people got away with it. There were some prosecutions, some lawsuits. They hired the corporate law firms, deductible business expense, if not reimbursable. No matter what happened, what was thrown at Halliburton, and a lot was thrown at him, the corporate structure of diffusing and escaping responsibility prevailed. On top of it, we give these corporations the rights of human beings, and they have privileges and immunities we will never have. And you see, we cannot have a democracy where corporations have equal rights with human beings. You have to have a double standard where corporations, constitutionally and statutorily, are subordinated to the rights of human beings. Only human beings should have constitutional rights, not corporations. So they should not be allowed to lobby as corporations. They should not be allowed under Citizens United to give money to any campaigns, independent or coordinated. They should not be able to engage in selecting candidates and huddling with them. All this should be crimes. Only individuals can do that. Maybe individuals inside companies, they have rights like anyone else but not the corporate juggernaut itself. That's, so the two ways to deal with corporations is subordination to real people constitutionally. That way we can tax them differentially, we can regulate differentially, we can make them put stuff in their envelopes to 
establish all kinds of groups, worker, labor groups, no constitutional barriers like the 5-3 Supreme Court decision. And the other one is displacement with small local business. And not so small, credit unions, community banks, renewable power, community health clinics, all that. That's the displacement, that's the self-reliance, that's what educates people on the superiority of business where you know where things are produced, you know who produces them, you know how they treat their workers, for better or ill, they're close by, you can hold them accountable. You don't know anything about 300,000 workers in China producing iPhones for Apple. They work 70 to 80 hours a week, they're among the highest paid workers, they get, if they're lucky, a buck an hour, no benefits, and the company supplies free nets on the second, third, and fourth floors to catch people who are committing suicide. Because they live eight in a dorm, they're separated from their families back in their villages, are abused in a whole series of ways, and they want to kill themselves. The, over, the turnover is enormous. It's not like, oh, well, they, they have no job. The turnover in the Maquiladora, factories on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande is 50 to 60% a year. They need the jobs, but the abuse, the living standards, the corruption, the harassment uh, is intolerable. Eight to a room? And so Apple Computer looks great. You know, it looked like a nice, clean company. They can't possibly afford to buy any of the products that they produce. And so the other day, it was repeated in the Wall Street Journal that Apple Computer is going to buy back $130 billion of their stock. Now, j just let that sink in for a minute. They've already bought back part of that. $130 billion of their stock is 13 years of EPA budget, if you want to compare it. It's not only 13 years of EPA budget, it's over 100 years of OSHA budgets. It's over 200 years of auto safety agency budgets, just to show you the scale. So we broke it down. I wrote a letter to Tim Cook, the CEO. He's had big publicity, favorable publicity. He's come out and he said he's gay. When are we going to get over that stuff? <laughs> you know? I mean, years ago, I, they asked me about gay people. I said, equal rights. Let's get it over with. We don't have too much love in the world. Get it over with. We have more important things to do than start differentiating different forms of love and stratifying them. So he's a big wheel now. He's come out gay and have all kinds of arguments, articles saying, will I help the company? Will it increase sales? Will it, retract, will it attract gay executives? In the meantime, 300,000 workers are suffering in China. So here's what we did. We broke down the 130 billion. Watch this. We said, Mr. Cook, if you took the 130 billion and put it in a foundation and it got 5% a year, and that's modest for, you know, big time investment. If it got 5% a year, it would produce six and a half billion dollars. Five billion dollars sent to the Chinese workers would cut their work week in half from 80 to 40 hours a week and double their pay. It would increase their ability to live, necessities of their family, and guess what? Some of them may actually be able to start affording your phones that they manufacture. No response. The other way to use the money, it could be used for research and development. You could use the one and a half billion left over to improve the salaries of lower paid Apple workers. They could put it in, uh, they could give the money to the shareholders and mutual funds and the pension funds. Support the mutual, the pension funds. Let people spend the money. They'd get a higher rate of return. So what's happened in this country is we have this stock buyback and I guarantee you we're gonna make this a big issue. This stock buyback by companies is going berserk. Why are they doing stock buybacks? When they can give the money and cash to their dividends, 
to their shareholders, or they can do R&D, or they can acquire a company, or they can create a new company, or they can create a foundation. Why are they doing it? Because it's the stealth way to increase the compensation of the executives at the top of the company. They retire stock when they buy it back, they put it in treasury stock, and it's waiting for stock option execution by the bosses. Or by buying back the stock, they reduce the volume of the stock divided by the profits, and they get a better earnings per share. And the earnings per share is often part of the performance contract to pay the top bosses. The other argument that the stock payback people make is that it increases the stock price. And the evidence for that is almost overwhelmingly negative over the longer term. An example I give, and I'll end on that note, is that Cisco was $80 a share in 2000. It is now at least three times larger. It has never missed a profitable quarter. It's bigger in sales. It's had $65 billion in stock buybacks from 2000 to now. And its share yesterday is $25. Went from 80 down to $25. No stock splits. What we're dealing here is another grotesque mut mutation of giant corporations whereby overcharging their customers and underpaying their workers abroad and elsewhere and overpaying themselves, they're piling up massive wealth and destroying its productivity. In the last eight years, stock buybacks of the major companies in America have totaled $2.4 trillion. They could have invested it in public works. You know, you could develop a bond system they could have repaired America. If you look at the American Society of Civil Engineers, they say it's about $3 trillion in deferred maintenance, starting with crumbling schools. So they could have developed a finance mechanism, which would return themselves a decent return in their bonds to repair America. Instead, the abysmally profound greed of these companies is they, stake, they take their owner's money, it doesn't belong to them, it belongs to their owners, and in effect put it in the most unproductive pot in order to further enrich CEOs making 10, 12, 15, $20,000 an hour, eight hours a day. Now, can that generate emotional intelligence? I think so. If we can't get it on national TV, we get it by spreading word of mouth encouraged by internet agitation. But people have to have something to say on the internet instead of the silly gossip and small talk that dominates the whole process. And I say to young people, do you know that 2000, 2008, 2009 crash? That's destroying your future. It's still with us. Unemployment, underemployment. They can't afford homes. They can hardly afford rent. And they're locked in with $1.2 trillion in debt. So why don't the young people organize and say, you did this to us, Wall Street, and we're gonna ram through Congress if we have to sleep around Congress 24 hours a day. We're gonna ram through a Wall Street speculation tax of a half a penny per transaction and raise $300 billion to pay off the student loans. And for those who don't have student loans, to provide technical assistance and training so they can get a better job. That's called redemption. That's called accountability. They not only got away with no criminal prosecution, they got away without any kind of responsibility for bringing this economy down, taking eight million jobs, bailing out trillions of dollars on the backs of taxpayers, and shredding pensions and mutual fund values. That's, what we, that's the way we have to talk to young people. We have to get them thinking justice, thinking reciprocity, thinking accountability. So going back to this, what do you, what do you think's missing in this segment? 
I'll tell you one thing that is missing. The, the families of the men that were killed are subject to workers' compensation laws. So when they're put out into roadways to be killed, their families have no recourse legally other than the meager amounts they would get for workers' comp and or the murder bonuses that are in their contracts. Under workers' comp. Correct. Yeah. Those families have no recourse whatsoever. And as a trial lawyer, tell them what happens if they're killed in deficient or defective Humvees or helicopters. Uh, tell them what happens to them as a defense contractor in terms of tort law. See, they're, they come under the government immunity. See what I mean by the merger of corporations and government? You can't sue the government, except very modestly under the Tort Claims Act. And so the, the doctrine that the courts have developed, urged on by clever corporate lawyers, is that the contractors are taking orders from the government, therefore they come under the umbrella of immunity of the government from lawsuits. So when 31 Marines die because of a helicopter defect that's notorious, they're still contracting to build it, it's very hard to get compensation. Yeah, Margaret? Is the military part of the commons? What? Is the military part of the commons? Of the commons? N not in that re respect. The, the problem is the military expands the immunities and privileges of these large corporations. And that's what the corporate state is all about. And that's why the right wing does not like crony capitalism, you see? It takes the risk out of enterprise. It's government guaranteed ca corporate capitalism. And they despise crony capitalism more than liberals despise corporate welfare. They have more fire in their belly against crony capitalism. Talk to the libertarians about it. It's like red before a bull. They see it it's a complete subversion of the free enterprise system, sink or swim, based on whether you meet market demand with your products and services. What else is missing, though? What else is missing? That's right. We, 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 we know that. But they're talking about Iraq war, right? Huh? Precisely, precisely. This film was built, was aimed at indifferent, uninterested viewers to try to charge them up. So you can see how a lot of the speakers are kind of twang, Southerners, kind of rednecks, red-blooded, you notice that? I mean, how are you gonna say these guys are radical? I mean, they're basically saying, I'm a patriot, I love America. These companies are bringing us down. They're cheating, lying, stealing. That's what it was geared to. Now, the, the question is, is it effective? Unfortunately, they left out the plate. I thought the plate was the equivalent of the $450 claw hammer, right? <laughs> you put two plates and it's 70, you know, 76 bucks. Two empty plates, 76 bucks. Yeah. Billions of dollars from housing for the troops who have John Kerry made more profit actually from the Iraq war than anyone else. Yeah. I mean it just made it seem yeah. like somehow Cheney going out right. instead of fundamental to the corruption of the war. Okay, it, unfair to it was an excerpt. You know, it's it's they got they got what do they call the additions? Extras and and the whole thing is over an hour and a half. They just, that's what they chose to excerpt for organizing purposes. That's what they thought would enrage people. Now, how many people you think saw that in theaters? All theaters all over the country, how many? Huh? 50,000 is a winner for a documentary. 50,000 people, imagine, only 50,000 people. We live in the golden age of documentaries. They've never been better, never been more numerous, never been brilliantly produced. We live in the golden age of muckraking books. I can tell you that in the 60s, if 10 muckraking books came out exposing the coal industry and the auto industry and the oil industry, today you have 100. 
You, you can't keep track of them. They're so, so good. Jeremy Scahill and so on and so forth on, on Blackwater. And despite all this, it's having less effect than Silent Spring, Unsafe at Any Speed, and the other America by, uh, on the poverty by uh, Harrington, Michael Harrington. So that, I'm just leaving you with, with that to ponder. Why is that the case? Um, just, you know, run with your own explanations. The most common one is we're overloaded. I don't quite buy that. We're overloaded. These are, these are really brilliant document. I mean, I, I'm not a documentarian. I don't know much about it, but they're superbly uh, balanced between real information and legitimate generation of, of critical emotions. Yes? Um, I agree it was a good thing and it seemed to work well. Yeah. Not uh, yeah. making it kind of apolitical to the Iraqi situation. Right. But do you, do you see any disingenuous in the, in this clip, the fact that you're not, uh, speaking about not what that you're not speaking of Iraq War. I mean the people's. I remember seeing right. clips of this, and part of my thought was, well, you know, you you went without questioning. Yeah. Yes. It, it, the the focus on is big business profiting from war, ripping off the taxpayer, endangering soldiers, endangering workers who are part of the contractors, very little on the Iraqis, right? You notice that? Okay, now, now I want to get, beg your indulgence. I'm going to show you another clip. And it's between, in a, in a church in Albany, New York, and it's, it's me and Patty Smith. And it was done without our knowledge by some Rensselaer engineering professors who were in the audience and they took a lot of tape and all that and they boiled it down to about 35 minutes. Now I don't want to burden you so much with 35 minutes but let's play f about 15 minutes. You will see another take on the Iraq war and do you all want to take a little break? Okay, well you, you go out when you need to obviously. Um, it, it's another take on the Iraq War. I want you to tell me whether it is sufficiently emotional, too emotional, uh, whether it is too fact deprived, too many facts. This is, uh, uh, even though I'm in it, I've never quite seen anything like that because of Patti Smith. And what she composed she composed a poem called Radio Baghdad when she saw the slaughter that was going on. And there was unbelievable slaughter. I mean, imagine firing on a defenseless city, one of the great historic cities of the world, from US destroyers and aircraft to start the Iraq war with the consummate imperialistic slogan, shock and awe. Yeah. Just think of that. And think of the people who didn't quite buy into pinpoint bombing on Saddam's palaces and this tremendous barrage coming at them and they knew it was going to be followed by an invasion from the most powerful military in the world. And they knew they weren't going to be defended by their leaders and Saddam. Think of the terror of living under drones 24 hours a day. We get upset when, a, when you have noise over an airport of civilian planes. Think of the terror of you got five or six kids in a small place in Afghanistan and you hear that sound and it can strike any time by buttons pushed by someone working in Nevada or Virginia trying to get home for supper. Think of, think of the lack of empathy. So this is what this is trying to convey. This is, I think, 2005 when the insurgency started. So what, what's your reaction to, the, to this approach? It just goes on for about 10, 15 more minutes. It's 35, 36 minutes. Yeah. Very depression. <laughs> 
Aside from the severe depression, it is more effective because it's a narrative. It's not a story. It's a developing storyline that becomes complex and more interesting and has surprises in it and tells you things that you become a more informed citizen as a result of getting the full context of what has occurred. Good. How about you? I would say a complimentary documentary is Norman Solomon. Yeah. Or why we fight by uh, Eugene Jericki. Right. Yes. Back there. This one has emotional appeal. It shows humans. It, it, it's supplemented, you know, by, by poetry, by music, by photography, by, by history, you know, by history yeah. as well. And it's on the whole history all the way back to the twenties of the British. Yeah. The first one um, allows you to sort of. Uh, Hate the companies that were yeah. trying, that they, they were, were gaining from. Mm. The second one, to some extent, well, caused you to hate yourself mm. because you participated. In it, because your elected leaders did it. I remember watching Shop and Hall when it happened and thinking, and we were all waiting yeah. for the first flash and thinking, this is absolutely appalling. There are people down there in their houses or in their cars or whatever, and they're going to get blown apart. And you see the explosions in our name. And, yeah, that's right. name of all of us. Absolutely. And so I think, to a certain extent, that carries a big sort of guilt thing. You can imagine when people say, I don't understand how these American Muslims can go to Syria and join ISIS. But you see this film, you can imagine what the motivation is. Mm -hmm. They're angry. Well, what, you know what's, in, what's interesting? Because we couldn't. We'll talk about the 2000 election, if it's on your minds, <laughs> later. Uh, the point is, there was no road show. You know, in retrospect, Ben and Jerry's had a bus that went all over the country on the military budget. I mean, no one st could stop them. They, they didn't get on the media, but they interfaced with probably three, 400,000 people in a direct way. I think this, we don't have an, a secretariat. This is what I wanted to urge on George Soros. Develop a secretariat to back up these retired generals, admirals, NSA people, and diplomats. Give them a structure to get them on the media, get them up to Congress, double their number, triple their number, all over the country. And use documentaries to drive the points home, in addition to their own very cogent arguments. It almost pains me to say we could have stopped the Iraq war. You just can't, you can't mount a propaganda campaign against James Baker, Brent Scowcroft, Marine General Zinni, and former head of the S NSA, Howard Odom. Not to mention the rest. Colonels here, naval captains there. So you see, although the Democrats could have blocked Bush on the war, they had the votes filibuster, they could have blocked him on the tax cuts. They could have blocked the worst things he did. Look what the Republicans are doing to Obama. I mean, they just didn't do it. But, you know, I hate to say it on such a grave matter, it required such a minimal effort, organized, focused, insistent, day after day. And we had the, the billionaire to do it. Now, what if Zinni and Scowcroft called Soros? They would have got through, right? They would have got through. Baker would have got through. It might have happened. Well, how do you get that? The problem is, the, the problem is that not all of us can do these things well. You know, there are some people that can break through, and you don't even know their name. You got to find them. You know, we can marshal the arguments. We can expose the fraud. We tried to get on the media. We couldn't get on the media. We couldn't. The media was completely locked in. I mean, I don't know if you remember. It was so disgusting. You know, they took the retired pussycats, you know, the retired toadies who were on fat consultantships that they, that they never ex disclosed. And then they got paid by the NBC, NBC, CBS uh, to provide commentary. And it was very, very restrained and self-censored commentary. Yeah, they were, yeah, and you remember 
he's, a, he's pretty embarrassed by that now. Remember Ted Koppel on a tank? And he, he was on Nightline, and they went over the border and where they shot their first Iraqi just at random from 250 yards out who was in the desert. You know, it's, it's, it's demeaning to the press. One of my friends, Paul, uh, Sloyan, Pat Sloyan, he worked for UPI and then he worked for Newsweek. He went over there and he refused to be embedded. And he really took him on. He won the Pulitzer Prize for that. But he told me just how demeaning his colleagues were to even allow the word to be used, embedded. If you, if you, don't, want, if you don't go over there as an independent journalist that decides who to ask questions, who to look into, don't go over there at all. To, ha to be an embedded journalist is an oxymoron. You're not a journalist. You're a puff piece. Yes? Before the first bomb, I remember people weren't asking the question. You said, you know, where's the proof? But there was one person, and I felt very focused on him, and it was Scott Ritter, because yeah. he had proof. He, he was a UN inspector. Yeah. He was the closest person that I thought could give me the real information. I believed him. But you know, after that, when, when Bush went in in March 2003, he sent his most trusted investigator with millions of dollars to find weapons of mass destruction. And about six months later, he came back to Bush and he basically said, boss, I'm sorry, they're not there. You'd think Ritter would have been vindicated, right? Well, you know what they did to Ritter. So. Yeah, yeah. And he, he had a vulnerability, and yeah, so. Don't you think Colin Powell could have been one of the great issues of stopping this war? Colin Powell is a profile in cowardliness. Single handedly, he could have done that. Single handedly, as Secretary of State. Yeah, yeah. And he was against it. Uh, but a good soldier. That's right. Took orders and didn't remember the Nuremberg rules which you do not follow an illegal order. This was an illegal war, constitutionally, UN Charter, Geneva Conventions. You can't do much worse than that. Yes? Three other people that were very, could have been more persuasive. Hillary, Hillary Clinton, yeah. John Kerry, and Tony Blair. And Tony who? Blair. Yeah, Tony Blair. Tony Blair. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Hillary Clinton was on the Senate Armed Services Committee. It's the right jurisdiction. And John Kerry, who someday will be the subject of a totally tragic, ironic movie. From when he came back from Vietnam, he called me up, and we had a three-hour meeting. He was a young soldier. And look what he's ended up, you know, being. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people. It's, it's the, coin, the, the coin of the realm in, in Washington is cowardliness. They know what the facts are. And they know what their duty is, and they betray their trusting public. Well, I have a question for you, uh, burning in my mind for many years, um, opportunity many of us wonder, how do you know so much about the miscarriages of justice uh, to the extent that you know, you know, there's a, it's an emotional um, toll that it takes and a burden. I mean, I find it very difficult to even, you know, go through a movie like this, and not of injustice, with the amount of empathy that I have, um, and uh, kind of hold it together. How do you, how do you keep persevering? And, and what, what is the, what do you tell yourself emotionally, you know, psychologically, to, to hang in there and fight the good fight? I think all of us could really learn a lot from that. First of all, I work overtime. <laughs> Second of all, when you really care for an issue, the facts you absorb obliterate amnesia. And you know that from your own experience. I mean, if you're really interested in an issue, how about a baseball fan who's a fanatic baseball fan? Can you imagine the statistics they know? Johnny Lindell hit 248 in 1947, you know, for the New York Yankees, you know? Um, so that's part of it. The other part is when you don't score victories, you have to endure repetition. So you keep saying it. And that keeps you in good memory, unfortunately. But the horrors of what happened. Did you ever see Madeleine Albright on 60 Minutes? That's a, that's a deep imprint. Uh, that was uh, 
Stahl, Leslie Stahl. By the way, if you say, where did this figure come from, 500,000 children dying? Uh, it came from the U.S. physicians group that was started to investigate it, and they went over there. And basically, you know, they didn't get the nutrients. Uh, they were dislocated in the healthcare system in terms of emergency. They had contaminated water because they didn't get the chlorine. We deliberately bombed their civilian infrastructure of electricity and drinking water. You want a, want a worse war crime? You know, Barbara Rizzo's book, Swimming Up the Tigers, was about the 10 years of sanctions. And she said it took the Iraqis about five years to understand that the U.S. was really their enemy. Mm -hmm. They could not believe what was happening. This is Up the Tigris? Swimming Up the Tigris. Swimming Up the Tigris by Barbara Rizik, R-I-Z-K. By Barbara Rizik, R-I-Z-K. She just lived there and reported, traveled extensively among the people. You see, the whole thing is you live a life of myths or you live a life of reality. The reason why Chomsky irritates the, the establishment, like you can't believe, is because he talks about the facts, historical and contemporary. And when they attack him, they almost never attack him on the facts. They say, he's anti-American. He's a blame America first guy. You see the evasions of the issue. And, you know, we're told about myths. We think that they're relatively few. It's not. World views are myths of what's going on. Myths. And look what we've got for it, right? We've metastasized al-Qaeda. We can't even count the offshoot groups. We can't even count the, where, the regions of the world now. They're everywhere. You know, we have fought stateless terrorism by increasing it immensely. And now you have ISIS. And the question is, with $70 billion a year of intelligence budgets and all these various groups, NSA, CIA, State Department, Defense Department, how did they miss the emergence of ISIS? Or did they miss the emergence of ISIS? I mean, it's not exactly a secret. When you're recruiting over half the world, you're mobilizing, you're training, you got satellites everywhere, we got satellites everywhere. How do they miss that? How do they miss the collecting of weapons? Now they're using our weapons, by the way, you know. And, and now, of course, is huge exaggeration of ISIS. I mean, ISIS does not have an Air Force, it doesn't have a Navy, it doesn't really have armed mechanized equipment. It's way overstretched, its supply lines are very weak, and it's alienating the local people, even their fellow Sunnis. They're so brutal. Unlike the Viet Cong and the Vietnamese rebels, who really went to work providing services in the villages and so on, they're doing just the opposite. They're not going to last other than the horrific daily suicide bombers that's been going on all, for years now in Baghdad, in Ibril, in you know, Mosul, 38 here, 42 there. We just had this marathon bombing. It took, what, two, three lives? The country went nuts. I mean, it, it was, it was the, the, the major news. Never mind hundreds of other people dying every day from preventable causes due to commercial profit priorities. We are extremely vulnerable. When the next stage comes and they start moving suicide bombers here or they're homegrown, what are we going to do? There, goes, there goes our civil liberties. There goes our democracy. There goes our budgets. There goes our attention to preventable violence of 300,000 deaths a year that we shouldn't tolerate in all these areas I mentioned. We're extremely vulnerable. Let's assume that it's happened. We're just now sitting here talking, yeah. and we have such an attack. What are we going to do? I ask myself that question. We're, right. If we don't do something different... We're all intimidated because, you know, what are you, soft on terrorism? Yeah, that's something, that's something we have to have analytic study councils all over the country because you know it's coming. Can you all hear that?
By the way, here's who I blame first, the civilian political leadership and the military contractors. The military does not like to get into quagmires. It's just an unpleasant way. They'd rather just go through the day sitting at their appointed places. Uh, it's dirty, bloody, vicious, cruel work, and they'd rather not do it. But once you get them in, they want to win. They want the latest military weapons. And they begin pushing the envelope. It starts with the combination of Congress, some of the right-wing neocon think tanks, and the voracious, unlimited appetite of the military contracting companies. We would be much better if we nationalized them, got rid of them all during the recession when their stock was down. We should have just bought them out completely. Uncle Sam acquisition. And then we wouldn't have had that propulsive profit in order to increase executive compensation, and et cetera. But that isn't even discussed, right? I mean, you can't even, James, Kenneth, Ken Galbraith recommended that. He said, look, 99% of their business is government contracts. What are we doing here? Why are we going through this charade? Senator uh, Admiral Rickover had the same thing. He said there, sh there should be substantial uh, government military contractors, if only to be used as a restraint and yardstick against the reckless ways of the private contractors. Yes? Quite often, the war machine's paradigm on the military action, particularly in the Middle East, yeah. is that chaos is good, destruction is good, because it's also going to bring about another economic, uh, positive economic situation. <coughs> uh, that's I'm trying not to be fearful of anything. That is a concern to me. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's true. Uh, it's true, you know, within limits. You know, we don't know that much about what pushes these guys in the Pentagon every day. I try to find out because I do t mix it up with them in the seminars. Uh, but I've come to the conclusion it's people like Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz and, you know, Feith and so forth. And these guys are relentless. They're still getting op-eds. They're war criminals. They're still getting op-eds in the New York Times and the Washington Post and getting on TV. And they were wrong, and they were proven wrong. And there was huge bloodshed, and they still get 20 times more than the peace advocates. Ramsey Clark, when was the last time you saw him on TV? When was the last time you saw uh, Bill Moyers have uh, Chomsky on, even the best programs? It's, uh, it's atrocious. I want to make that point in a different way, but let's, yes. Um, before the second video, you asked us to think about how uh, we convert that factual information into emotional intelligence. Yeah. Right? And I was thinking about that during the, this second video, and, and why is it when people know the facts <coughs> and know how corrupt things are, know it was done in our name, why no action's being taken? And, and I, I think it's two things. Um, I like your thoughts on it. One is this sense of hopelessness and apathy, like there's just nothing I can do and they're just going to do whatever they want anyways. And the second, we've entered this era now of, you know, digital heroin, where I can just turn on my Xbox, turn on my Netflix, and just consume something that's going to numb me out and I'm not going to have to worry about it. Electronic cocaine. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we're still uh, missing the main point, I think, with uh, unfortunately, all we need is 1%. Let's say you're right for 99%. You have 3 million people really organized. That's what they do in their life beside their job. Uh, maybe 300,000 of them are full-time civic advocates linked. I mean, why don't we have one-tenth of the organizational level as any corporation? You know, a lot of it's just organization. I remember when I was a kid, my dad asked us around the table, he said, what's the most powerful force in the world? You know, say, uh, uh, religion. We'd say, uh, you know, government, we, we, whatever. He said, no, it's apathy. Apathy allows the worst things to happen in the world. And it's what, what uh, Edmund Burke said, enough good, good men, as he said it, do nothing, for, you know, allows a lot of evil. So instead of starting at the 99% <laughs> start, you know, the big mistake that 
Occupy Wall Street made. I mean, they did nice things. They were young. They were pretty naive. They didn't want to associate with politicians. They didn't want to have leaders. They didn't want to recognize leadership. They didn't want to raise money to perpetuate themselves. The big mistake they made after they gave us the 1% slogan, where are the 99%? And there's the 1%, Wall Streeters and so on, is they didn't say about the other 1%. Give me the 1% and we'll take care of the Wall Street 1%. First of all, because they have no principles and they're very opportunistic, and once they lay the law down to them, they'll adjust. Once they know they can't pay, pay their, buy their way out, they will adjust, and just like the auto companies, they learned how to make a profit from airbags and seatbelts. But they've got to realize that the movement to hold them accountable is no nonsense. It's not going to be co-opted, undermined, or bought off. Once they reach that threshold, you'll see a remarkable scaling down and adjustment. You'll see some now fossil fuel companies buying up solar companies. They, they see the writing on the wall. By the way, the Koch brothers are pouring money into southern legislators. This is fun. They're pour, pouring money into southern to a push for a tax surcharge on solar panels. So they're oil and gas, interest, right? And guess what? They're losing. Because there's no such thing as a Republican or a Democratic solar panel. These guys want jobs in their local communities. They want, they want their, the homes to be put solar on. They have made it illegal to go off the grid in Florida. Yeah. They're, yes, but that's not going to last long. That's not, you got the Goldwater son is, is, is one lobbyist against that. That's, that's a, huh? Yeah, that's not going to last, but they're losing in more, more states than they're winning. And as the solar industry gets more powerful, look at the, the medical device industry is about to get rid of the 3% sales tax to help pay for Obamacare. Um, even though they are tremendously subsidized by the taxpayer, I mean, most of the medical devices of importance have roots in government R&D. And they get tax credits for doing R&D in their own companies. You pay them to do something they're supposed to be doing anyway. And they still don't want to pay uh, the sales tax. And they got Senator Franken and Senator Elizabeth Warren on their side. Do you know that? Because you have... Uh, medical device companies in Massachusetts and, and, and Minnesota. Uh, so the solar industry is going to start being heavyweight, and, and they'll, they'll be able to deal with that. It's unstoppable. The solar industry has had a lot of false starts in the last century. Uh, one of them, by the way, was uh, Henry Ford I, Edison, and the heads of MIT and Harvard put out a statement in the late 20s saying, have I told you this? Saying, anything you can produce from hydrocarbons, oil, gas, coal, you can produce from carbohydrates, plant life. So why don't we grow our fuel? Why don't we use photosynthesis? Why don't we use solar energy? And unfortunately, that was the, the point in time when the DuPonts and Dow Chemicals we're starting to develop the petrochemical industry big time. And they prevailed. That was an extremely serious fork in the road that wasn't taken. The second fork was Truman had a materials policy commission, advisory commission, in his last months in office. And, and they came out in 1952 and urged that the government go solar in their promotion. And that by 1975, three quarters of all homes would be solarized. And two years later, Eisenhower instituted the Atoms for Peace program, and they went nuclear. So another pork and roll. But you see, there was no mobilized citizens behind those two forays. We're going to have electricity too cheap to meter. Too cheap to meter, yeah. You know, we are lied on so often that we don't even know it anymore. I remember the cable industry muscled its way uh, forward by saying it's pay TV, folks, and you won't have to see advertisements. <laughs> have you seen advertisements on cable TV? How about this one? Public radio and public broadcasting. 
We need advertising free radio and TV. Every 10 minutes, WPXR support comes from, I mean, it's maddening. How many times they, they give these 15 second and 30 second commercials? That's why we're your retirement company. By what? That's, a, that's a, 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 a Blair's sponsor, uh, the life insurance company. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's not just the life insurance, so. Well, I was thinking of putting an ad on, on public radio anonymously saying, um, anonymous says, get rid of these ads in terms of their names. Right? <laughs> Now, I just want to make uh, the point that comes out of this. We own the public airways. Uh, the companies control them. Uh, they don't pay rent. We're the landlords. We're the, they're the tenants. We don't pay rent. It's like we own the Mississippi River, but do we lease it free to exclusive portions on the banks to private companies? No, we haven't gone that far yet, have we? The Mississippi River is the commons. We haven't parceled it out. But we have parceled out the public airwaves. When Herbert Hoover, Hoover was Secretary of Commerce, he said the new radio technology should be a public trust and not have any commercial stations. This is Herbert Hoover. See how far we've come? So here, here's, here, I want to make a proposal. How many of you have watched recently ABC, NBC, CBS and Fox on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> How many of you listen to Rush Limbaugh? Okay. All right, here's the problem. People like us have so separated ourselves from the way mass audiences are delivered over network television that we have no interest in it. We don't watch these sadomasochistic weekday shows, you know, where they have bouncers and who's cheating on who, you know, the Ricky Lake shows and the Howard Springer shows. We, we don't watch them. If you look at the ads, you can see who they're targeting. They're targeting deprived, un, unhappy, frustrated, low-income people. People who vote for politicians who betray them because it's God gays and guns, let's say. Or that's the only Valium they see trying to get through a, a day of deprivation and frustration and, and anguish. All right, that, you, you look at the ads. All right, so, now listen to this. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. Let's just let me finish this. They have so many cable stations now. I was in a hotel the other day, had a 1,000 cable stations. I couldn't believe it. I didn't even know this monster existed, right? You dial for 641. That's some, you know, there was a, there was a cable network I was told years ago that was going to feature chimps. They were going to have chimps prancing around. Citizens don't even have their own cable. What do they got to do, dress up like chimps? And... I mean, it's beyond satire. Now look at this. <clears throat> One consequence is their audiences are getting smaller and smaller because they're being split so many ways, right? Now what is on Saturday afternoon TV? Infomercials, guys in bikes flipping over into ditches, you know, you know that thing, okay? Uh, third run movies, You'd think the, the film is worn out. And I saw the other day, soccer in England. Boy, that's of great interest to the American audience, right? And the dullest game in the world, golf. Golf, right? Because they, they say it's high-income people who watch golf, you know? They talk about baseball being dull. It's a... Uh, okay. All right. Hey, you put a you put a ball in a hole. Can you imagine visiting Martians watching this nonsense? A ball in a hole, a ball in a hoop, a ball over the fence, a ball to a receiver. It's all about throwing balls. 
Okay. I thought of something interesting. If the audience is that small, if it's down to, say, a couple hundred thousand people, uh, this is network TV. Why don't all the citizen groups, AARP, Consumers Union, Sierra Club, Public Citizen, Common Cause, People for American Way, uh, Greenpeace, why don't they all get together and go to the network and say, look, we want an hour on Saturday TV and we don't want any interference and we will deliver a bigger audience and we'll pay more than you get by your advertisers. And we'll have a one hour, one hour magnet to bring more and more people into citizen training, into civic skills, well done, well produced, not dull, into examples of what people are doing in Massachusetts that people should be doing around the country or vice versa, why reinvent the wheel, issues that really affect people, like Seattle improved their blood transfusion years ago and people were getting hepatitis and so forth and contaminated blood, uh, that would be on. How did they do it? How did they build these great co-ops in Minnesota? And they're now achieving critical mass and they're becoming federated and so forth. Okay, and uh, heroic whistleblowers and so on. So everybody gradually knows, and we go out to all our memberships, that this is the program to watch. We get a national audience. We start raising money for some of the various groups. Now, why doesn't somebody do that? You see, part of it is they didn't think of it, but even if they thought of it, the level of organization is amateurish. It's trivial, it's embarrassing compared to any modest middle-sized business, any dollar store, any chain store, any tool and die company, I just visited the Corvair group down, you know, the small parts. And I was, I was embarrassed, not because of the Corvair. He started out as, he owned two Corvairs. And he started out collecting parts. And he started being known. And people started saying, do you have this stabilizer bar? Do you have this part for the engine? Because GM just got the hell out of it after they stopped the Corvair in 1969. Make a long story short. Just think of the organization, the intensity, right? He's an honest man. He was a husband, wife, small business. He now has 25 full-time workers. He has Quonset huts with thousands of Cor Corvair parts manufactured by small business around the country because they couldn't get any more from GM. And then he brings out two parts catalogs, I swear, they were this thick, detail after detail, page after page, one model car, station wagon, Monza, you know, I mean, basically one category of car. And he thinks, you know, we're, he thinks I'm worried about, you know, what he thinks, and he didn't want to be acerbic, and we sparred very mildly on certain things, you know, like carbon monoxide leakage, in Corvairs, and he says he didn't hear of any fatalities, even though they smelled fumes, and anyway, it was a cordial meeting. What was going through my mind is, find me, find me the National Citizen Group that is organized at that level. Just think of that. So let's just work on finding organizational geniuses here. The whole door-to-door -door canvassing started for progressives, by one guy who started the Hudson Bay Company. And none of us knew how to do this and make it work. Hire people, pay them a living wage, and have them meet their quotas, knocking on doors for fighting water pollution or you know some other issue. And he, he was very crass about it. He said, I can make money on this. And he, he did. He set up a national system. He was pretty tough. You didn't make your quota more than three days in a row. You were out. And I said, you know, people said, that's not citizen movement. That, that's too commercial. I said to myself, he's giving a level of organization that's pretty impressive. And Clean Water Action, which is an offshoot of one of our groups, picked up on it and actually developed an even bigger national 
canvas. So it, is, it does come down to the kind of things we often don't like to do because we're interested in substance, we're interested in seeking the justice, getting the facts, making the recommendation, challenging, exposing, and we very badly need these, these organizational experts to take it to a different level. Yes. I agree with you 10,000% about the organization. This oh. guy you're talking about with the Corvair <coughs> business, he's bringing in money. You know, if you start a nonprofit and activist organization, you're not bringing in any money. So how is the person, the three people, the three people who are starting this organization and putting in 20, 30, 40, 50 hours a week, supposed to pay their bills at the same time. They bring in money because canvassing brings in money. Progressive canvassing brings in millions of dollars a year. But so they designate a non for profit and they give themselves a the salary? Yeah, it's a, it's a fundraising approach, and also you give people pamphlets, and you have a little conversation at the door, not in virtual reality, person to person. And once in a while, you find someone who wants to join you and wants to be a participant. Um, or, you know, in terms of advocacy. Uh, sometimes they're a little too brass knuckles, you know, they're on quotas and all that. But, you know, they want to keep going, and, and uh, so they make the, the decision. Um, however, none of them really are getting super rich who are running these canvases, obviously. Uh, but that's one of the success stories, let's say, of superior uh, organization. All right, now before we go to lunch or dinner, where is this? Okay, here's an idea I thought of. Let me, let me see how you react to this. How many of you have uh, paid alumni dues for colleges and universities? Okay, and, and you've contributed, right? So we all know that. That's an established tradition. So it occurred to me, I'm going to put this up on the bulletin board, wherever it is, along with this, you know, the insert. It occurred to me that why not have birth year gifts to America? Why not take the birth year of 1928, led by a few in initiators, and reach as many Americans as possible who were born in that year, and they want to make an, a lasting legacy gift to their beloved country so that it can be handed over in better shape to their descendants. Okay, it makes sense. It's a new affinity group. And, you know, if you, somebody just came up to me earlier and said, you know, we were born two weeks apart. This, you know, it strikes a chord. Who was that? Yeah, it strikes a chord. We were born in 1934. So I developed an ad, and it says, Ralph Nader proposes a new American tradition, birth year gifts to America. Americans born in each of these birth years can together fund their own legacy gift to lift our country's future. And then I list, I started in 1924, and went to 1944. So we have people who are 90 down to people who are 70. You know, when they start looking at posterity and how their children, grandchildren are going to view them and what they're going to do with their money. And so just to make it specific, I said, together, people in each birth year can advance significant self-renewing nonprofit civic institutions to improve the life prospects of our descendants Starting now, below are some national and local examples to stimulate your imagination and ideas about your birth year gifts, what your birth year gifts could accomplish. I gave him 25 examples. And then I said, and add your own proposals for enduring initiatives. Okay, I'll read some of them. Organizing after school clubs for civic skills and civic experience in the community. Make it, uh, awarding Moral Courage Awards in all 3,007 counties in America to encourage and support people who stand tall. Organizing Veterans Against War, the men and women who have experienced preventable war and violence. 
organizing congressional accountability watchdog groups in all congressional districts, promoting faster conversion to solar energy and energy efficiency, building over 2,000 community civic centers all over the country as Andrew Carnegie did when he built over 2,000 free libraries. Whatever you say about what he did in the steel industry, unbelievable consequences to that gift for people everywhere, youngsters. He didn't donate the land. He required the community to donate the land, you know, co-ownership. Co Activating the older generations of Americans to share their wisdom and experience with the young, arm around the shoulder, creating arboretums in communities nationwide, um, preserving and enhancing the valuable commons owned by the people for the people, creating facilities for participatory neighborhood sports, both organized and unorganized, enacting public financing of public elections to give voters more choices and voices, accelerating the end of dire poverty and hungry, hunger in a wealthy world. Organi this is my favorite. Organizing the enlightened super rich against war and poverty and for progressive tax reform, led by Warren Buffett. <laughs> so, all right, so unfortunately it doesn't have a happy ending. I bought an ad in the Baltimore Sun. Saturday. Uh, I want to buy it on Sunday. Sunday it has 300,000 circulation. Saturday has 175,000. They bumped me on Sunday, at a discount by the way. They bumped me on Sunday and in return they told me I could have a free ad on Saturday. So I took the ad. 175,000 circulation in homes around Baltimore. I mean, obviously, even though newspaper readership is down, that's a lot of people, right? You want to ask me the obvious question? I got one response. And here, and here is the response. Here is the response. It was a fairly wealthy person. Not super, but I mean, he's well-to-do. He says he wanted a re to reform America by enacting, don't laugh now, by enacting the Ten Commandments as amendments to the Constitution. Well, thou shalt not kill? That's not bad, right? I mean, okay. That's all I got. Now, we had an email. We had an email contact. No, sorry. Yes, we had info at nader.org and the P.O. Box. We got zero at the P.O. box and one at infoantnator.org. You know, most people wouldn't tell you the final disposition, right? It did. It was in the paper. We, we got people to buy it in suburban Maryland. And I asked that question. <laughs> and, and it went out. Now, part of it is that most people don't read the newspaper. You know, they just flip through it few headlines. But you know where they put this? In the best spot imaginable. They put it opposite the editorial page and the cartoon. They put it in the best spot. And of course it was much bigger. You know, it was bigger than this. Now, am I entitled to be discouraged? Hell no. <laughs> I'm fighting mad for this idea. So I, I'm, I'm dickering with the New York Times. Apparently, they, they have holes in papers at the last minute, and they give it to you very cheap. New York Times ad goes for 120 grand, 100 grand, 80 grand, but at the last minute, you can get it down for as low as 10. As long as it isn't commercial, as long as it doesn't have a fundraising coupon, and as long as it isn't political. Well, okay, this doesn't have a fundraising coupon, it's not commercial. And it certainly is not political, it's civic. Then I'm going to try other ways. And I, I solicit your ideas. Well, I think you only got one response. Yeah. Because you didn't require that people clip and send three Rice Krispies box tops. <laughs> then I would have had to pay. Okay? And I'm not sure that would have done it. But it would be good to have a controlled study. 
right? Now, first of all, how many of you, don't you think this is a good idea? I mean, it's, 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 it's great. It binds people together. It's, it's a little exciting. And by the way, between 70 and 90, you got a lot of well-to-do people. And a lot of them, you know, might leave their money to spoil their great-grandchildren. You know, the old idea, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. People in genealogy would like it. I mean, people what? Who are looking at genealogy. People who are looking at genealogy. Any other ideas? A would different, be a different well, layout. I mean, would be interested in that. Okay. It, it's not an inviting layout in, in my... What would happen if we had Britney Spears here? No, no. <laughs> a Lady bigger Garden. headline yeah. that someone couldn't miss. And, right. You know. But apart from the layout, how would you disseminate it with a better layout? Twitter. Put it on YouTube. Twitter. <laughs> We're ready to roll it out, by the way. Huh? Giving them a choice. You see all the time they, they let you check off which one of those you want to get to. Oh, that's not a bad idea. Like, like a poll. Like yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. That's right. Oh, that's a good idea. Go ahead, yeah? Who are you aiming at? Huh? I, I, I'm, you know, people over 50 are, might still be reading the paper. I don't read ads. So if it was an article about it on the op-ed right. section, I'd read it. But okay. I, just, I just blank out on ads. Now, maybe I'm weird. I, I, I don't know. No, it, it's interesting. Uh, by the way, it is interesting to know that the Baltimore Sun didn't write an article about it. This is kind of a cute idea, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes they do. Like you have a, a unique ad in the New York Times and then they'll write an article about it. But it, I would say one out of a hundred where they do that because they don't like to give their commercial, you know, free. Do they have different donor levels? No, you can't add. The, 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 the rule, you cannot ask for money oh. in this ad. Then they'll, they'll charge you top dollar. Yeah. Ralph, who is it aimed at? What birth year? It's aimed at the birth years <coughs> from 19... That's what I mean. The guy wouldn't know. In other words, if it said, were you born in what yeah. birth year? Yeah. Or is it uh, and sort of about what's your legacy going to be? Well, no, it, it indicates, you know, it's not as good as you might think. It could be, but it does indicate which year were you born in. I would have, I, I'd have that break. Okay. Because if it's going to be my year, I'd say, oh, yeah. what's that? That could be, right. yeah, that could be good. I, I was struggling to give them as many ideas as possible. Right. Yeah. Uh, I always lean in the wrong direction. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, looking at how the Baltimore Sun is doing their ads, I noticed that they have a lot of people are very capitalized as far as what they see yeah. and how even with TV media, Seconds. Yeah. Even though you got a long list, for me, the headline states it, just a couple of examples, and then the bottom, even though, as like you said, you have so much more work that can be included at this location, you can get expanded. So less is more. Yes. Because okay. 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 I, I, I think people nowadays, when they see something big and long, they read the headlines and they start and then they turn out okay. the page. Kickstarter. Kickstarter? Absolutely. I don't know if it qualifies, does it? No, but you can yes. raise your yeah. money. It does qualify? Yeah. 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 Aren't, they, aren't they restricted to a commercial business? Yeah, yeah they are. But you can use Indiegogo no. instead of Kickstarter. Right. And you can use Indiegogo instead of yeah. Kickstarter. Yeah. They don't have those restrictions. Okay, Indiegogo? Indiegogo. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is, this is very good. How many of you served on juries, by the way? Okay. Did you find it a rewarding experience? Yeah. It's overwhelming the case. And you know, surveys of judges show that a majority of judges agree with the jury's verdict. Here's regular people brought together, no axe to grind, no future ambition. And they can decide, they can produce decisions affecting extremely powerful defendants, not just criminal, street criminals, very powerful defendants, BP, GM, Exxon. That's why they want to kill the jury system. That's why the tort deform movement goes after the jury system. Uh, I have one more question. Yeah. Um, I'm 
Okay, so how else did this, well, uh, apart yeah, from the, apart from the layout? Yeah, make one of the boxes tied into your other thing, and one of the boxes would be future elections can vote none of the above. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. None of the above. Yeah. That's a great By point. the way, I, all these are elaborated in these books that you're getting. Right. See? <coughs> the, these are the covers of my oh, books. Okay. Okay. okay so, so apart from the layout, which, you know, <laughs> how many times can you lay out differently when you, you know, you can get charged top how dollar? Do you want to be remembered? Yeah, something haunting like that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> A bit too funereal? On your way out. All right, I'm serious here. If you can give me on a little piece of paper before we can conclude tomorrow, give me your ideas on how to disseminate it and how it can be better. But the more important thing is how to disseminate it. Repetition. Can you email it to the group? Huh? Can you email it to the assembled group? No. No. I mean, can you post that so we can see it? Yeah, we're going to post it. Oh, right. Yeah. Where, where is it being posted? Isn't there a bulletin board? Uh, I can get some tape and put it up right here. That would be good. She can put it up right here. Right on the wall. Okay. I see. I bent in the direction of examples, just because it's so new to people. The whole birth year. And they said, "What are you talking about?" And I want to answer that 25 times, but it was at a price of the visual, the, the graphic. Yes. You don't really know the impact. You only know your numbers of how they reacted to you. That's a good but point. You may have as many people yeah. who cause them to think deeply about this issue and are going to deal with it yeah. in their own way. That's an excellent point. We really don't know the intangible impact of people who, who didn't go to the next step and contact us. But they're saying, hey, you know, this is interesting. For your case, you need a sustained campaign. You need to build trust in people over a period of time. Okay, excellent point. You need a little group to advocate it. You hit the jackpot with three birth years with some wealthy people. What if you get someone like Buffett saying, hey, this isn't bad. I was born in 1928. Uh, you know, I'll put out the word with three of my friends that I play bridge with or whatever. You don't think that's going to get news. It is going to get news. Okay. We're not, this is just the beginning. See? And I, I'm just saying that, it, imagine putting this to a high school class. Imagine putting it to a college class. Imagine putting this to a gathering of AARP or a senior citizens a center that, that's bored out of their wits, okay? Where you, you, you say, you've got something significant to contribute here. By the way, this, is, this isn't only national. These sound like they're national. But it, it could be local. For example, a local arboretum. Arboretum is a great teaching mechanism. So I can see, you know, here in New England, there's plenty of 20, 30, 40 acres. You can do a lot with that. Yes? Um, I was told that for the not-for-profits, it takes six months of visibility and repeated visibility in order for something to happen. That's number one. But the other question I have, how much do you think your name versus an organization without your name would have an impact? Don't know how to do that. But I see, either people like me or I'm a lightning rod. So I figure I win both ways. You see? <laughs> uh, pardon? Yeah. Right. except that it's not uh, the affinity group. The key is the affinity group. When we started uh, Princeton Project 55, I got tired of going to reunions and they, they want to get us drunk and write checks. You know, I mean, it's so demeaning. Um, they put us in tents and have uh, the band. and I mean, they treat us like children, except when they ask for money. And I, I had a, a meeting with some of my classmates. This is demeaning. They're not respecting the intelligence that they thought Princeton was enhancing when we were there. So lo and behold, we got 25 of our class of 750. Well, by then it was about 600. This is a 35th reunion. So it was class, in, it was 1990. And we started 
Princeton Project 55. It was a nonprofit group, and it was designed to place Princeton undergraduates and recent graduates in systemically oriented citizen advocate groups. We very clearly said it was not going to be charity. We were not going to put them in soup kitchens. There's a difference between charity and justice. A society that has more justice needs less charity. And while soup kitchens are very important for people who need them, they don't deal with the prevention. They don't deal with how do you prevent hunger in a rich country. It's absurd that we have people who are homeless, people who have to go to soup kitchens. So justice deals with preventing these, these horrors, and uh, charity deals with ministering to the immediate need and pain. So we went systemic. And as a result, we were the major placers of Princeton students, uh, internships and fellowships, and it changed their lives. They had to think systemically. And we also, uh, after some resistance from the administration, uh, we became a talking point to attract pr students to come to Princeton. It now has morphed, because you know our class is getting older, it has morphed into a Princeton Alumni Corps. And it's just what John Gardner, who addressed us the first meeting we had, he said, do not dilute your class. The minute it went to Princeton Alumni Corps, it was spread over a lot of classes, you know, it lost that priceless elan of cohesiveness by people who knew each other when we were 17 and 18 as we entered Princeton. And so that, that's the difference. Now, I might say, and you remind me of something, Carol, can you, can you imagine how much 150,000 Quakers and 130,000 Unitarians have done for this country. Just think of that. I don't think there's ever been more than 200,000 Quakers or Unitarians over a period of 100 years. Look what they've done for this country. A tiny fraction. And I, I would think someone would write books on, on the Quaker contribution other than Nixon who uh, left the Quaker world, and the Unitarian contribution. And there it is, again, you see, it's a small number of people. Yes? How about making it like competitive? Like in this room, there's two from 34, you know, and then you just have a, like a small, you know, uh, once a week, us days. Yeah, well, once it gets underway, you would do that. You would show which, which affinity, which class, which birth year was really advancing more and more rapidly. Last question, because we have to break. I would, uh, find out where your target audience is and post, post in those places and also physically go to those places. For example, you mentioned AARP. Post in AARP. What are the civic groups? What are the recreational groups that the, the people at 70 to 90, you know, in the economic yeah. strata, Go to those places, not just the newspapers. That's the first one. Yeah, well, that's very true. You know, AR convention is huge. You know that. They have like 20, 25,000 people in Cobo Hall in Detroit or wherever they meet. Uh, yeah, that, that would be good if you get the, their willingness. But, you know, a lot of these groups think it's uh, com competing for funding and competing for dues. So you got to get over that. But it's not insuperable. Now, we do have to go. What time is it? It's time to have dinner, and um, I'm going to give these to Celia. Our reading is a great teaching mechanism.